Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Welcome another episode of Paranoid American Podcast. And today I've got an interesting guest that I guarantee you, you don't see on the uh, the normal circuit. And that's my friend Newton Lillevoix from Dream Fury Comics. So, uh, amen. First of all, it's good to see you. Uh, we've known each other for at least a, a few years uh, working on like a project here too. And I love your work. Uh, I, I feel like you, you don't need an introduction, but I'm going to give you a quick introduction uh, in case people don't know who you are. So you, you run Dream Fury Comics, and you've got a couple books under your belt. And I know way more that you've got cooking that, that haven't come out yet. Um, <laughs> but we've got Keisha Demon Eater. We've got Crescent City Monsters. And please tell people where they can maybe find you, uh, find your books. And I, I think you're in uh, New York City too, right? So, like, are there any shops that you want to give a shout out to that people could actually walk and grab your books today? Because I know I got a bunch of listeners in New York. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah. Um, first, thanks for having me on. Um, it's always good to get on these uh, podcasts and just uh, meet and reach out to different audiences that um, may not have heard of me. Um, I'm not super famous, but you know. I'm sure there's just like, wait, bro. You'll, you'll, I'm gonna uh, people are gonna be seeing uh Newton Lillivaw at the end of like the Netflix uh little credits at some point and be like, Oh, I think I've seen that name before. Where was that from? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. In fact, um, maybe to have my own version of Netflix, <laughs> but um, even yeah, better, that's even better. Yeah, um, like you said, uh, uh, I'm the founder of Dream Fury Comics. We have uh Keisha Demon Eater and Crescent City Monsters as um, one of our. Uh, two books. Yep, there it is right there. And um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And yeah, so so yeah, um, yeah, I'm based in New York City, so yeah, shout out to everybody who's who's in New York City right now. Um, and actually, you got any yeah, shops that you regular there? Uh, yeah, there's one um, in Yonkers. It's called Spider's Web. Um, that's that's the closest one to me. Um, I go there every now and then. Um, you know, I, I don't really visit a lot of um, the, the comic shop like every week. Um, I probably go like maybe uh, once a month. I'll oh, go tisk, into tisk. No, I'm just kidding. That's that's more <laughs> than I go, man. I'm not, I'm not the greatest about it. But yeah, I wish I went some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I used to go a lot. There was a point where um, I guess uh, when I was right out of college, and I started working, so I actually had money. <laughs> so uh, once that happened, I was like, I started going to the comic book shop a lot more. And because during college, I didn't really um, buy comics; I was broke. So even you know, even a dollar fifty was too much. <laughs> it was too much for me. So um, 
So I didn't really buy a lot of comics during college or read a lot of comics um, either during college. So it wasn't until after college that I started um, buying comic books. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. What was your... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious what kind of comic books did you uh, read growing up? Because... Because you mentioned um, in one of the other bios that I read that like you read around the age like nine or eleven or something uh, like like were you a DC guy were you a Marvel guy yeah like... yeah so when I was growing up um, I was introduced to comics um, by these two classmates uh, shout out Cedric Richardson and um, <laughs> uh, Delroy it's funny how you remember these guys names. But yeah, so um, they they and they were big Marvel guys, and they they kind of um poisoned my viewpoint in terms of DC. So um, oh yeah, I just read strictly Marvel. Um, they were like, ah, oh, DC's corny. Da, da, da. Yeah, you're in good company, man. I, I'm I'm the same way. <laughs> so um, I mean, looking back on it, I wish I had read a little bit more DC because they they did have some cool titles. Um, but yeah, I was mostly Marvel. I loved everything. Um, anytime somebody asks me that question, it's hard because um. I loved Avengers at that time. Um, Thor, Thor was great. Um, That's crazy because Thor is the, in my opinion, Thor is one of the closest you can get to a DC character within the Marvel universe because yeah. DC loves the like the the sons of gods and like you know creatures oh, yeah, yeah. from outer space versus <laughs> you know like toxic you know sludge got on you where the government put some kind of uh, device in you so i always kind of felt like well, like thor and namor and, and like some of the dudes that are i don't know more like mythological they always felt like they could cross over with dc easier yeah yeah i, I see what you're saying for me thor was because um i guess i guess um when i think of thor i always think of um walt simonson's run and um from back then and that's that's what i always remember um some of the newer stuff is good too but um from back then when I was reading, that's what I remember. And, and they, they, the cool thing about it was he was like, not just like an actual just superhero. He was actually a god. So he would do, you know, godlike adventures. You know, it wasn't like a typical superhero way. He was like fighting these um, these bad guys who were out to. He's stopping uh, a bank robbery yeah, or something. Right? Yeah, exactly. His, his stakes was higher and he, he lived in a different world. And then sometimes he would come back to Earth and say, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, you guys need any help? You know, so. So I thought that was always cool. Um, Silver Surfer. I like characters like Silver Surfer because I just like the the whole cosmic thing about it. Um, you know, that kind of overlaps to the idea, too, of like Fantastic Four. Because like, I guess I, I liked a lot of the non-typical superhero because like when you, look, when you look at the Fantastic Four, the first they were a family and then um, and then they used to go on these like space adventures and sci-fi so and they lean towards more the sci-fi thing and i like sci-fi so i thought um you know fantastic four was cool and then you had the avengers was which was like the typical you know superhero team thing um you're hitting all the classics like these are all these are all like the golden oldies right yeah 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 so yeah those um so i was i was a big marvel head and you know i still am you know i've, I've been reading a lot more dc but i think because i didn't grow up on it I don't really have a lot of that nostalgia towards it. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I do read DC, I was like, I'm like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> the nostalgia is yeah. powerful, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I read something from Marvel, you know, it's like I'm, I'm more deeply emotionally invested, you know, in it. So, yeah. You got any uh, like obscure or underground titles or, or labels or anything that you've come across in the years that you really liked? Like something that, that wasn't just you'd find in a regular shop on the front shelf? Uh, yeah, I mean, a few, but I can't really remember them because they're that underground. Actually, you know what? I would say um, I'm going to – this one. let me see if I have it. Oh, I, I have it. Hold on. Let me. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. I'm, I'm interested. Got a nice collection of comics back there too. <laughs> yeah, so <clears> – <throat> So I'm gonna give it this this comic a shout out. So this is um Shadow Eyes. That's a uh, thick one too, man. That's a thick boy. Yeah, it's huge. And so this is um this is by uh yeah, this is by Sophia Campbell, but the publisher is um Iron Circus Comics. And this is the first comic book I ever bought on Kickstarter. And so after seeing this, I was like, wow. I was like, you know, um, I think I'm actually gonna start uh doing comic books and then um, go through the route of uh, having them funded through Kickstarter. So, and this here, and the, the 
the cool thing about this here is um it's like a sci-fi I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of sci-fi and yeah, it's it's different. It's cyberpunk. So, so this is the one that inspired you to end up making Crescent City and start Dream Fury or or did that just like push you over the edge and you already had it on mind? Well, that's the one that that inspired me to um start writing comics. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so um once I read that, I was like, okay, I understood like okay, um the people who are doing things on Kickstarter aren't just doing superhero comic books that they're just doing uh, comic books that they love in, in different types of areas and subject. And initially, I don't think there were a lot of superhero comic books before, when when I used to um, uh, support uh, Kickstarter projects, like uh, the comic book projects. There were a, mm-hmm. there weren't a lot of superhero comics. They were more like the the fr- on the fringe comics, you know, things that you typically wouldn't see on the comic book sh- shop or back in yeah, the Yeah, I got days, I got a theory on that. Right, it's because. <laughs> In the early days, when you could do, when you're talking about these more fringe comics, I think a lot of those comics, people were ready to publish it and they just never found the right fit. So once it was mm-hmm. like, hey, here's this easy avenue. And then other people are like, oh, wow, people are self publishing comics on this platform. And then they are like, okay, I'm going to start working on this comic. And then you just kind of get like all crowds and way more variety comes in. Um, but I, I, I think it's an awesome ecosystem. Mixed thoughts on like, you know, the fact that we've got these like monopolies forming and what, what is it, like Indiegogo and you've got like Kickstarter and ultimately all they're doing is just handling the money and taking a little bit of cut along the way. But at the same time, they offer these huge platforms where there's people that legitimately like that's their comic book shop, right? It's Kickstarter. Yeah, like they don't yeah. they don't even go to the, the local shop. They're just like constantly wanting to back projects. And I find I mean, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just stand for the, the like the Kickstarter backers and Indiegogo backers and stuff, but like they really make original projects possible that would never, ever, ever happen if it weren't for people that were like so interested in idea. They're like, look, I'm gonna just drop twenty dollars because of how much I like this concept and just hope I get a book at the end of it, which is wild. You know, it's it, like you would never do that in a store, right? Walk in and be like, yeah. hey, that 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 book on the shelf that says it's coming out in like four months. Yeah, here's 20 bucks. I'll, I'll be back later, right? It yeah, doesn't yeah. happen, but I don't know. It, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. Yeah, the um, the market first started for like comics that, you know, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't see on the shelf, you know. And, you know, it makes sense because if you're... um. If you're a comic book creator at that time, and even like before Kickstarter, right? You, you would um, you would just create these comics, and then where would you go, right? You would try to find a publisher, right? And because of the fringe aspect of your comic book, you probably couldn't even find one. So you'd probably just do like um, these underground comics, or you know how uh, originally comics was spelled um, with an X at the end. If you're yeah. Underground. <laughs> now I think they just kind of like use the x you know here and there wherever but you know well, now they do it as like a style thing to yeah, like yeah. imply that they've got the edge that was established yeah. by the real yeah. x back in like what the 60s 70s and like the tijuana bibles and stuff yeah yeah those those were real hardcore underground <laughs> so, was like, so but yeah so you, the only option you had was like what you would um maybe your local comic shop and um and comic cons so um so yeah, um, Kickstarter changed all of that, and you know what's interesting too. Now to think about it, I used to, um, my brother, he had a friend, his name was Leo, and he used to create comic books, and this was like maybe, like I would say it was a long time ago because if if I give you the years, <laughs> it'll age me. But so yeah, he we'll say nineties, yeah, yeah, early nineties, yeah. Well, actually, I think this was still in the early two thousands, but um, okay, 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 he used to create comic books. And at that time, um, I used to kind of watch him from the sidelines to see what he was doing. But was it professionally um, or as a hobby? Um, I guess as a hobby, but you know, he he had these little comic books and he um and it would be basically like a comic book kind of based on um uh his world because uh he used to do uh, a bike he he was a bike messenger, so he would um uh, create a comic book based on the ca- character who was That's wild, man. You probably see a lot of different things every day in that kind of a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and you know, it, it that sometimes I think about it because I was like, wow, you know, at that time, it never occurred to me, even though I saw somebody creating comic books, never create occurred to me like, hey, maybe I should create comic books too. <laughs> and I was like, so, um, 
you know, and, and I always think about that. And I always think like, sometimes it's just about timing and, and are things ready? Are you ready? You know? Um, so yeah, I was, I was, um, always think about that. Like how, how I never really jumped on that, that bandwagon like 20 years ago. I could have, I could have said, Hey, you know, he's doing comic books too. I should do comic books. But at that time I just, I guess my mindset wasn't there or it just didn't seem like something that was, um, that, you know, that I was, I guess, prepared or ready for, you know? It, it might be for the best too, man, because making a book is a huge endeavor. It's like a, a yeah. large commitment of time and energy and effort. And not just that, man, like it, this is crazy. But when you're working on a book with someone, it's like you become like family members for a while. Cause, cause like a legit, an issue at the very, very least, may maybe take like a couple months or it might take like a year or so, right? And if you got yeah. like eight issues or 12 issues you're talking about, you're talking about spending like, you know, time with someone and build a relationship with the artists, with like everybody involved in a project. Um, so it's, it's like a huge, it's like a huge thing, right? And it also takes like a lot like emotionally and mentally uh, out of you. So again like if, if you're in the mindset where you're just like oh that's cool he's doing comics i kind of like the comics and then like you go off and do your own thing um it, like it might not have been the right moment you know because it would have been easy to underestimate how much effort and like attention it would take you know what i mean yeah yeah you're absolutely right that, that's a good point because um i think at that at that time it was really it was even harder to make comic books right like everything was more physical oh, big time even though um the digital world was starting to rise if, you know, Adobe and their little products to, you know, self-publish and things like that. Um, you still, it was still a lot more difficult. Like now, you know, my artist is in another country back then, you know, it was, it would have been a lot more difficult. Um, even though the internet was around then, <laughs> it was, still it was there. I mean, Deviant Art was there and that was yeah. like the only game in town as, as mm -hmm. far as I knew back in the early 2000s. You were basically just searching Deviant Art. And if you didn't find someone there, then, you know, like, I guess you're looking around like knocking on doors or something. Yeah. I mean, the whole infrastructure wasn't like, it wasn't complete. Like, so I don't think PayPal was around then or if it was you probably couldn't um, pay. I think it was called X originally, right? Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It started as X too, I think. Yeah. So like all these, all the little, little components that you need to be at the point you are now where like somebody like me can be at home <laughs> just writing and, you know, sending out files here and there and just getting everything done. Um, over the computer, um, you know, at, at that time it was it wasn't exactly built for that. So the infrastructure wasn't there. Things were a little, a little just uh, just a little bit more difficult. So I guess you're right. Yeah, the timing it's it's all about timing, you know. Because I, I don't think I'm not sure if I would have had the patience, or I'm not, I not okay. I would have had the patience, but I don't think I would have had the um the time to learn everything that I needed to learn, all the things that that's required to create a comic book. Um, I don't think I would have had that time to, to actually learn all that. I think it's, it's uh, an interesting like dichotomy because comic books are almost like, as you're growing up at least, and, th and there's a lot of personal bias here, but comic books are always like the silly frivolous thing. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just reading comic books. And it's almost <laughs> like a waste of time. This thing that's like kind of for children. But when you get into the actual production, like the writing for, I mean, in my opinion, again, like the writing for comics is way more complex than for like a screenplay or for like a short, you know, novella or even like a traditional novel, you know, barring uh, like James Joyce level kind of work. But the amount of, of thinking that you have to do where you've got to like visualize stuff and put it in mind and you can't just leave things to be vague. You have to put things in such visual and specific terms. One of the, the clear ones is you, you're never supposed to be describing a video you're always describing like a still image in time so if you can't right. take a picture of it and describe what's happening in that picture so it's not like no the car's not moving you know what i mean like the car like it's a snapshot in time so nothing's ever actually moving so everyone's kind of like frozen and understanding that aspect and the aspect of between panels and the aspect of like the page turn like these are all like magical elements that don't exist in the realm of video at all like there's no such thing as a page turn in video they do like wipes. That's kind of what that's supposed to simulate too. And they're like those old school wipes where it's like yeah, later, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? That's supposed to kind of be like a page turn, but it still doesn't have that, that kind of effect. So, and that, that's a small rant. <laughs> no, 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 I agree. And the best writers are the ones who, um, who understand the, the and appreciate the, 
the, the medium of comic books because you know you can sit down and just write on panel one you know he does this and he says this and da, da, da. but you know there's certain times when like you have to actually visualize like okay what 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 do i want to achieve so sometimes you you know you're like okay in this page i want to break it down and i want it to be this one big splash page but maybe like have um you know you could say oh i want like uh four the four corners to have a panel and then you know um i want to do this so like and then and kind of help the visuals tell the story too um because there are a lot of comic books where i'm I'm reading it and then they do something in the panels and i'm like oh wow you know i've never seen that before i was like that's cool i gotta remember like that. a little effect that like draws your eye or, or something yeah, where or they something break like, the fourth wall or you got any examples um, like I guess the last one because there are a lot of times when I see um certain things, and but I always forget it because I'm like I'm, I gotta remember this because I gotta copy this. <laughs> but, so it's sensory uh, overload all the yeah, time now. Yeah, and I never remember. But the one the one thing I do remember was um Robert Kirkman's um oh, what's his book uh I forgot the Outcast um in the panels he would have like regular panels but he would always include like these small tiny little panels where he would like um. If somebody was smoking in one panel, he'll show like a small panel with just a finger on the, um, the cigarette, right? And then he'd have all these little panels that would like highlight like certain little parts of a previous panel or like um, the current panel. And the, I was like, wow, that's a pretty cool thing that he's doing because it kind of like when you look at the smaller panel, it like draws you away and like it's kind of like a silent moment. And then you, you go back to the other panel. And I was like, wow, I was like, that is pretty cool. And he, he scattered that throughout um, the outcast. And um, I was like, wow. I was like, I wonder what what his thought is, and when he when he was writing that, did how does that <laughs> look in the um, in the um, in the script? So like little things like that 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 kind of like appreciate and like. You yeah, know, that, it's next level because at that point the guy's thinking about like video edits and like special effects and camera angles and yeah i'll do like a bunch of flashes, but instead of just being different panels, then the actual structure of the panels becomes part of like the artwork and part of the storytelling and then it, it, it's such a fascinating medium to me i mean we can we can geek out about uh comics non-stop obviously like lettering too man like good lettering can sometimes add to the story in a way that's like you don't even see it right when you're writing the script and then like a new lettering effect comes in and it's like man this thing just like it throws a big exclamation point at the end of a point you're trying to make like literally sometimes right like a huge one yeah and the, the it's, it's funny that you mentioned because just uh yesterday i was reading um uh what do you call it i was reading flashpoint and um you know it's a dc book so i don't remember all the characters but there's this female um character and i think she I th no her name was El elemental i think right um, they're all the same it's dc they're all the same character <laughs> it's like taco bell bro <laughs> you know what i mean so <laughs> seven ingredients they just kind of rearrange them and put different wrappers on them i'm, I'm just kidding i'm kidding yeah yeah <laughs> i'm trying not to upset any dc fans <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so um and the the lettering her bubbles um they had like a splash of, like these it was like a green dot and i and, but it was like this uh it wasn't a, a perfect circle it was like this green sp splash on it and i was like that is cool i've never seen that before so there's always like little things that you, you're reading in comic books that you see that you know that you know people are always adding that you know if you, if you're really like if you're really into comics or like you know maybe if you're just a comic book writer or creator <laughs> you might know this like wow because you know sometimes I'll, I'll look through a book and i'll go from like the I'll look at the the design of the book and the front page and see if there's anything new that I haven't seen before in terms of um, how they laid something out and what they did. Um, and one of the things I like is uh, something's killing the children. How um, they they oh, great book. That's a great great book. He, he starts he starts with the story. It's it's almost like TV. I was like I think this guy's running it for TV because he he like that's a new trend, right? People like <laughs> make the comic to make the TV show. Yeah, because I was like, oh, this is I think I've seen I've seen I think I've seen this on TV. So he'll he'll start the the story, and then you know, um, end on some kind of like oh, kind of <laughs> situation. And the next page is something is killing the children, and so I I really love that. I'm like, man, that's that's so cool. <laughs> and that's like, it kind of reminds me of a, a TV show when when um what's, what's his name Tyrion does that. So you know, I thought that was pretty cool. It, it's such a, a fun medium too and another cool thing about comics too it's almost like the old 
uh, like album artwork where you would just stare at it for an hour. You know what I mean? You'd stare at like the same picture for an hour and keep finding new things. Uh, And, and maybe there's like, there's like levels of how much you can appreciate the comic medium, the more you spend time with it. So at first it's just like, Oh cool. It's like an illustrated story. Um, but there's still words to read. And then it's like, oh, wow, look at how the words and the way the words are written and where they're placed are adding to this. And then you start realizing like, oh, man, the time lapses and like the tricks that, that you mentioned, like, oh, that's a really cool way of establishing this point without any words. Uh, and it, you just keep going deeper and deeper from there to the point where you're like, man, I love how they did the like the the um, like the legal text on the bottom of the title page. It's such a yeah, clever yeah. way to you <laughs> yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Because uh, you look at all the of it becomes an art. You're like, oh, you know what? I like that, that he used, uh, you know, that stupid little thing that says, um, if this uh, these characters are not represented. Yeah, they're like the little trademark or something. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, oh, look how they did the QR code. That's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. See, and you, this is a good point where you said that, like, if you were trying to do this maybe in the early 2000s, there was less resources to try and stitch together all the different components you might need. Um, now, look at us. We're headed towards the other end of the spectrum, right? So, the, like, in a few years, maybe you could just go on a website and be like, yo, I want to make a comic about, you know, Ladybug Man. And it's just like, here you go. Here's 20 pages. Here's a script. Here's the artwork. It's like, what do you, what do you think about the like the world of ai and the world of comics combining in any way do you think it's sacrilege do you think it's like heretical to even to say it out loud or what no yeah i know this (laughs) is one of those subjects that you know you don't want to (laughs) touch but like well and the reason i don't want is it's difficult for me is because i'm also a technology guy i love technology so like you know the prospects of ai is just so it's not just fascinating, but it's like really exciting. Like, wow, all these things that we could do with AI. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not against AI really, um, or AI artwork. Yeah. Um, and specifically in the realm of like art and hell, we could say music, we could say writing just, you know, kind of like the, uh, the, the entertainment categories in general. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not really against it. Um, and I, I understand why people um, are against it because, you know, AI, the, the models, they, 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 they're they based on other people's artwork, right? Um, but I mean, you know, that's how humans work too. Like a lot of artists, they, they base their, um, initially they base their style on other arts, right? They, they copy styles from people that they like and they, they admire AIs doing the same thing. Um, with that said, you know, I don't, I, you know, I personally, I, I, I don't I, I, I wouldn't use I wouldn't like say that AI would is going to um to initially like uh replace artists and um writers um even if even when they reach the point that they can because a lot of times when you look at these um these stories and, and the fan base, people are attached to people and the story, right? Like um people actually stand online to get autographs from writers and artists, right? Because the, the, this is stuff that they're actually producing. I'm not sure if people would feel so much excited about somebody who, you know, just writes a prompt and creates artwork. Um, I could see I think, it happen. I could see people lining up at a Comic Con and then, like, months later, they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, that guy was just hired to be this, like, the face of this AI that wrote and illustrated. And, like, or like the AI contacted the guy on Craigslist and hired him too. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean like, um, uh, like a ghost ghost everything like ghost, ghost writer everything. slash artist and then you just hire the face of the project you know here's here's the the guy that made the comic and he's just paid to be the guy that made the comic because the guy that made the comic is just electrons oh i see what you're saying that that's an interesting concept oh. well, <laughs> that, the, the one that i think about a lot is that let's say that you're anti like completely anti-ai i know i know you're not because you just you know kind of explained it but like, let's say an anti AI person watches a movie and then they're like, man, what a great movie. And you let them sit on it for a while. And then you're like, by the way, the movie was completely AI generated. Do you just all of a sudden stop liking that movie and convince yourself it wasn't good because of information that you got after the fact so that like, you know how it was made? Uh, like, would that affect you if, if you had some kind of like a, like felt some kind of way about it? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it's hard because. You know, right now, um, I can say what I'm saying because I've 
I work with um, AI tools, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is nowhere near replacing us. I mean, it's, it's really good, and this is really impressive. I was like, it's still not close to replacing. But, you know, um, I know that it's going to come to that point soon. And I can see the situation that you're talking about happening, right? Like something that's created by AI, but they put a human face to it, right? Cause, well, um, because, because it's going to almost be like a scarlet letter. Like, th I mean, th this is funny, but like in the art world, um, it's a huge divisive thing. And it's almost like the GMO uh, battle where, where people want to have like a GMO sticker on every product that you see in the store. There's yeah. almost like you have to have a, an AI sticker on your products if you use, you know, artificial artwork uh, as opposed well, to yeah. like artificial engineering. I think they should do that because, you know, um, like I said, there's always that human component to every piece of art, right? Like um, when you listen to music, um, sometimes I'll, I'll listen to a particular um, a new new album or something from some artist, and then um, I'm like, yeah, this this music is cool. But then sometimes, you know, I'll dig in more into their, their background and thing, and I'm like, wow. And then so now, because Good example, I, yeah, <laughs> like because now I can relate to them more, and I see like where they're coming from. You know, when I listen to their music, it means a little more, or it's a little. I, I look at it from a different perspective, so. There's always that human component. You can't do that with AI. When something like if an AI creates a story, you can't find out its background, you know. Um, but th now that I'm saying that, I'm thinking like maybe they could create artificial people with the artificial. Well, backgrounds. I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, like, dude. I mean, I, I think that there's going to be a point when, like, we've like me and you have never met in person, but I trust that you're a real person, right? But I mean, right. in ten years from now we might legitimately be wondering like, yo, this dude I've been talking to, is this, <laughs> like this could just be, you know, some Fiverr algorithm that, you know, someone's paying. So yeah. I, I think at that point, it's just like, how much does someone care to create an artificial reality for you? But anyway, yeah. I would, go yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I think, um, and I think, and believe it or not, I think the fact that um, AI is going to happen and then people are like, oh, well, um, now the, the livelihood of artists are, are is going to go away. I think, the opposite is going to happen because what's going to happen is like people are going to the fact that something's real is going to even mean more you know like so like instead of like something that was just created through a computer i think it's going to mean more to the average person that it was created by another human being so i think um human you know artworks created by a human being it will be even be valued even more especially really good artwork i think what's going to happen is it might ai might just uh, get rid of um because you know with everything right you you have a bunch of artists you have a bunch of writers um it's like a, a, a curve bell right like yeah, the, yeah the bell like curve. <laughs> it's more like a pyramid right on the top you have like the top of the pyramid you have the really great writers and then you know the middle is like you know the average writers and then thing you have the you know so so or below average writers so um i think ai is going to get rid of the, <laughs> the below average writers it's and, how pyramid schemes work usually. Yeah, you, like uh, you use that foundation and just kind of like keep the ones at the top. <laughs> yeah, and I think the the real good people are gonna are gonna still be around. I, I think it's just gonna be like the the I guess the the less skilled or um um the below average people will probably um, go away. You know, or the, or the people in those lower I guess tiers they learn how to use the tool and like keep them at the, the forefront of that. So oh, at least yeah, they can like yeah. stay, you know, on, on the curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That could be it too. So what, what about uh music, man? Do you think that AI could generate uh, music that could compete with like a top 40 song you'd hear on the radio and kind of not like a song that you wouldn't skip, but you don't have to be in love with and like appreciate all the artwork behind it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think AI can, re re but pop music though. Yeah, pop music. Could you think yeah, AI could just replace pop music? Yeah, yeah, it could. I think I, right now it probably could because pop music is so generic. You know, it it appeals, not, and I'm not saying there's anything bad with pop music. I like pop music, but it, it appeals to the more simple stuff. You know, like oh, these throwing shots. Uh, who are you throwing shots at indirectly? Katy Perry? Who? No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, I like pop music, but it's not really like really super complicated stuff. You know, or like things that um, like I said, it's 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 good music. It's make you feel good music. Um. And, you know, um, I'm sure AI has the algorithms to produce those make you feel good music, like the specific notes and stuff. So, um, but yeah, um, 
that that's actually a scary aspect of it because in the in and maybe this is just because you know this is the paranoid american podcast and i'm I'm in the conspiracies but i feel like the next big thing might be a like an ipod or like a music player that can tell what kind of mood you're in and then be like okay you're sad here's here's some of like your favorite sad songs or oh you're happy i'm gonna play this and and it might know what mood you're in before you know what mood you're in you know what i mean like there's sometimes that that like an hour will go by and be like damn i've been grumpy for the last hour what's <laughs> going on you know what i mean but ai i feel like th they would know it before you even start exhibiting the obvious signs that you might still not pick up on so the yeah. way that it could do that it's like if you're in a certain emotional state like there's no competition. Like if you ask me what song I want to hear, be like, you know, don't don't bother, you know, don't bother me. I'm grumpy. What do you mean what song I want to hear? But if like a, the right song came on at that time, it would be like, oh yeah, like I'm I'm into this right now. So th there's some element to that. And if you can extrapolate that to like movies too, right? You pop on Netflix, and it's like, oh, Newton's in a in a good mood. It's Friday night. They're like, there's no uh, out of emergency, you know, jeer board tickets on fire. And it's like, this is what Newton's gonna watch right now. And you could just settle into it. And it's it's like a cheat code. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, so I think certain people like it, certain people won't, you know. So I think like there's this this um this natural ability for to for certain people to understand, feel like when something's not real and they just feel uncomfortable, they might not be able to you know pinpoint what it is, but then they, you know that feeling of like, hey, something's not normal or something's not natural. Yeah, the uncanny valley, right? Yeah, so it's like they're like, okay, um, you know, something doesn't feel right. And I think there's a lot of people who just naturally just won't fit into that world, you know. That's a that's a good point because basically the uncanny valley comes up a lot in like the early Disney movies, and, and it's gonna be big when they start making androids that try to interact with people, right? And what happens is that the like the closer you get to reality the more your brain starts picking apart all like the tiny little details that don't make sense that don't match up with reality. Mm -hmm. So like a, a regular, and it's, it's a weird concept because like an impressionist artist, right? You, your brain discerns less. It's, it's not trying to pick apart the details because it's already like, okay, this is kind of abstract. So that's like a lady sitting by a lake, even though it's clearly just like a bunch of splotches of color, right? But you're like, okay, it's a lady by the lake. And then like a little brown splotch shows up. And you're like, okay, yeah, it's a dog. It's, it's legit. This all checks out. But then you take that same thing and you make it look hyper realistic, but it's got some of those weird AI artifacts you talk about or like, like a strand of hair is just in a place that an artist wouldn't have intentionally do that because it doesn't make sense or like a wrinkle like extends into the lake and you're just it, it, like no one would do that in a regular thing and then your brain hyper focuses on that so i i do i agree with you i think that there's some people that physically would become unsettled by just being surrounded by ai artwork all the time and it's it's not even a preference thing it's not like oh you know i i can't stand that this was made by computers it might yeah. be like I don't feel at ease right now because I feel like, you know, like my brain keeps pointing things out and I don't know what it is, but it's giving me an uneasy feeling. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think computers will ever be able to make a, an exact replica of like the real world. And, you know, we feel like, oh, yeah, this is the real world. It feels so natural. <laughs> Well, dude, this is a this is a perfect segment because I I want to ask you what about like human clones or something. But hold on, before before you get crazy, uh, I'm gonna play a little intro, and then after the intro, I'm just gonna ask you a bunch of kind of like random questions, and I just want you to give me a score zero to ten on like how much you agree with it. So if if I say something, you say zero, you're like rolling your eyes, like don't even ask me. That's the dumbest thing ever. And if it's a ten. Then it's like, yeah, like this is legit and I'll convince you of it if you just give me like five minutes. All right. And then anything else in between, uh, we can get into more discussion. But uh, does that sound good? Do you understand the rules? Yep. Sounds good. All right. Here we go. Hey, conspiracy buffs. I double dare you to take some PCP, the paranormal conspiracy probe. On your marks, get set and go. All right. This is the first hit of PCP. Do ghosts exist? Um, yeah, what was the scale again? Zero, uh, zero to ten. Yeah, so ten, yeah. They ten, uh, ten, like like 100% ghosts exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, reptilian humanoids exist. Yeah, zero. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Freemasons control global events to this day. Um, hmm. 
I'd go with a six or seven. Wow, that's strong. Okay, we're gonna get into that because the ancient uh, city of Atlantis was a real city. <clears throat> um. Yeah, but not not the way they describe it in um like TV or anything. Okay, so we'll say six or seven. Yeah, I say six or seven. Yeah. Michael Jackson had a clone. Yeah, zero. <laughs> zero. Yeah. Anyone had it? Any celebrity has ever had a clone? Zero. <laughs> any human being ever has ever had a clone? Oh, any human being? Um, you know, there's some country out there. I wouldn't be surprised if you know it's happening okay, in some okay, country where like they're cloning people in secret. So I'd, I'd give it like a seven. Okay, I, I think we're on like mine on that. Mm -hmm. Crystals can hold magical energy or spiritual energy. Hmm. So it depends how you define magical. Um, you know, because it could be really just science. <laughs> well, well, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, like, I, I mean, yeah. If if you scroll it away into there, I, I agree, man. Because technically, like, quartz can hold an electrical charge, and it can drive. Uh, you know, it actually does drive, kind of like synchronized stuff. So, I mean, crystals can hold energy in that yeah, regard, so, yeah. but I that, like, but I mean, like. Could you like sit down and focus and like uh like you know meditate energy into a crystal? Um oh meditate energy into a crystal? Yeah, could like could you could you like spiritually charge a crystal, not like applying a an a legit electrical current to it? Like could you I, know, I think I think you could. Uh, yeah, maybe like, gotta so give I'll it a number, man. I gotta seven. I gotta know where okay, six seven. or seven, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're gonna laugh. You might laugh, but uh, the world is flat. <laughs> yeah, um, I give that a zero. I was at my barber shop, and my barber was like, "Yeah, the the world's flat." I was like, "Dude, the world's not flat." I was like, <laughs> "I was like," and and it's funny too because I was thinking about it. I was like, "Okay, how do I know the world's not flat?" Um, and I, I I remember like what was the reasoning that I came up with? It wasn't because oh, it was um. The fact that there's different, um, what you call it, uh, seasons um, on the opposite side of the uh, the equator, right? Because I've met somebody from um, Argentina who's on the opposite side of the equator mm -hmm. in New York, and he's like, "Yeah, um, it's winter over here when it was summer," and I was like, "And I was like, well, I was like, that's it. I was like, that's my proof right there, because like you know he's not making that up, and that's the only way you could explain it, right? If the world, the, the Earth is a circle, that's the only way." Well, maybe. I mean, dude, I, this is my world now. So I've, I've heard almost every explanation. And so, A, if you discount that the dude was clearly working for, you know, the CIA and lying to you. No, saying, so you, you discount that aspect <laughs> of it, right? But then there's also the concept of localized weather systems and localized suns. Like, you're, like the sun that you see in the Bronx is different than the sun that they get in the Argentina because they each have their own local version of it. It gets wild, bro. I'm telling you. The that... problem with that is like you have to do too much explanations, like too much of these like. Oh, that's the name of the game, dude. So Welcome like, to a three-hour explanation about why the, like, the world you, is flat. If you, if you have to create all these different like reasons of like things, like like for example, if they said, "If oh, we didn't go to the moon," I and you know, to me, yeah, yeah. Give I me a number. Give me a number on we went to the moon. Um, I, I believe that we went to the moon, but I could understand the logic of, i can understand the logic behind that we didn't go to the moon because well um the fact that we lied about it just to bankrupt um uh russia is like i was like oh that makes sense smart yeah. idea <laughs> yeah it's like yeah that makes sense and then now you have to keep covering up the fact that you didn't go to the moon so you have to lie about all these other things right um so some of that makes sense um i could see why somebody believes that but i'm like man that's like a real big lie i was like that's well, let me that's let like, me read that one in particular and see and get your thoughts on it so let's let's just assume for convenience that the united states did send an astronaut and they did land on the moon and they did step out on the moon and everything like we've actually been there but what if there was something wrong with like the tape or the stream or like something goes wrong right and they're like what are we going to do just like radio broadcast it and hope everyone believes us especially russia and that they're not going to pick it apart and question it so like what would be you know, in your what's the rationale zero to ten that it's rational to think that they they made a backup and then maybe had to air the backup on TV, um, despite actually having gone there and just not having the proof for it. 
Yeah, I can see that happening. But I mean, I, I'm not sure why they were worried about the radio because I'm sure the Russians were able to intercept the radio signals from <laughs> from when we were transmitting from the moon. So they would be able to verify that way, the Russians at least, um, that we really did go there, right? Um, I'm, I, that, I mean, that's my thinking. I'm not you know, well-versed in um, radio transmission technology, but, <laughs> but I'm thinking like they should be able to see, um, intercept the... Uh, I mean, Nixon had a real time phone call on the moon. Like he was, hey, how's it going on the moon? They were like, hey, it's it's going awesome. But I so, mean, those those little sketchy. Did, but they um, was it was it real time? I mean, was it like because uh, that it, it was, was it was better than some Zoom calls that I've been on this year. <laughs> I'll say that much. Yeah. So okay, hold on. I got I got a few more. I got a few more for you. Um. Ma so I'm interested. Do you think magic is real in the context that you could like somebody could order a book off Amazon about how to do magic and then like that weekend accidentally summon some kind of I don't know, a, a creature or or put some kind of like a, a spell on themselves or I, I'm oversimplifying the terms, but do you think that it's real enough that that's a possibility? Um, I have a theory about that. I think certain people could uh, like are just built to practice magic and some people just can't because um it's like it's like um have you ever met somebody who's really like hyper they're on 24 7 it's like and they're not on drugs <laughs> just, just, yeah i mean so, I've, i know some some manic depressives which they, they go from like well, i'm gonna write a novel and then they do it <laughs> and then it's like you like they go into like extreme bouts of depression uh like back and forth but yeah, yeah well, i don't, I don't know anyone that can just be on all the time though no, they would no, explode I've, yeah, I've met people who just like they're on all the time that's great well you're in new york too like you kind of yeah. have to be like already closer to that end no <laughs> yeah and usually they, they tend to be like more of the like on the higher end of like the iq <laughs> these these people they just da -da -da -da, rabble on about stuff and you're like okay i can think of a few yeah 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 dude <laughs> so, and i'm like man doesn't your brain ever like take a downtime just to like process things they just process things so quickly and then you know you have people who are just naturally um leaders right it's like I, i've met people who are just like they're so charismatic and um thing uh, charismatic and there's something about them that people are just drawn to you sometimes you can't just you, you can't explain it for whatever reason they it's just so i think you know there are people who are just born a certain way and um, they have certain abilities. So I think they're m people who probably are a little more, um, uh, I guess, geared towards, you know, being able to press. So I don't think like somebody who just a regular person can just be like, oh, I'm going to read a book and practice magic. And and then I don't, I don't think it's, and I think it's, so I think first you have to probably have the ability to, right? And then I think you probably could do a little magic, but I think a lot of it is based on, on belief and you know your ability to actually um will that belief <laughs> into the world so you know so you I'm, might I'm, accidentally be like a like a unknown prodigy of magic though and like you know f around and find out almost yeah 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 so i think <laughs> i think it's possible because i think like you know with because i was thinking about just the other day and i was like man the hu how much information does the human brain contain because i remember um a couple of weeks ago i had this dream of um, one of the schools that I attended, and it was it was a school that I only attended for one year, and and it was like the the it was so vivid, and I was like, wow, I was like, I can't believe I even remember how it looked, in, you know, in that sp specific area of the school, and I was like, my brain actually kept, you know, that um that piece of information. I didn't even know I, I didn't even know it was there, you know. So it's holding a, a mass amount of information, and I don't think it's just information. I think it's um, this is going to sound crazy, but I think it's also like, you know, um, like I think like in the future, when you think about it, like space travel, mm -hmm. traveling like the way they do, they talk about light speed. I, I'm, like um, I'm sure they, they could do that in the future and maybe like 500 years in the future. But I think space travel is going to be through the mind. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be through like astral projection. Yeah, because I don't think because traveling through space and the speed of light and there's so many galaxies and stuff. And I think the mind, I think the mind has um, abilities that we don't understand yet and that we haven't used. So I think, you know, traveling will be, you, you travel to different places, but um, use your mind. It'll be way more efficient, right? Because at this <laughs> point, I think that we could 
theoretically we could go to any place in the entire you know solar system but the problem is that you run out of water at a certain point and and food and energy right and then you're just like a drift and you kind of starve to death and there's really no solution for any of those things on top of like uh the whole aging thing right if it if it takes yeah. you a lifetime to get somewhere then it's pointless because you know you're you're not there anymore by the time it shows up so yeah um yeah actual I mean, projection is like the only way that a lot of that could actually happen if it were real yeah and uh, yeah and that's and i think that's um i think that's the, the the way people will i think that's the best way i think that and i think we we have the ability to do that it's just that we we just haven't discovered how because like i said because ever since i watched it i forgot what it was it was some years ago I was watch and they explain how big the universe was and, I was, and how far the galaxies are. Um, and it keeps apart. zooming out more every time yeah. you're like, oh, wow, that's big. And then it's like. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I was like, you know what? I, space, I, have, I don't want to go to space. <laughs> it's not in there for humans who are meant to be on Earth for me. Um, yeah. So, but I was like, and traveling to space, like what we see on TV, I was like, even if you could like travel faster than light, it still would take a long time. I was like, what? I was like, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like we're talking about not even the top 1% that actually care about going out there. I mean, let's be realistic. Once humans go into space, I think like a, a big majority, again, I'm biased here, but I think a big majority, it would turn into like a carnival cruise. Like we're in space, let's get drunk. You know what I mean? And that's <laughs> going to be the majority of the money going to outer space and, and a large segment of people's interest. And then the people that are legit cared about the astronomical implications of space travel, they're, they're going to be in the, the extreme minority at that point, but I think it'll be more accepting, but yeah, it's just going to be like you get to float and get drunk at the same time. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, you're right. Probably just more. Like of a, not a lot of people care. Like, oh, look at the sea. You know, like I'm so glad we're out in the ocean. It's just like, oh, let me get another margarita over here, please. Yeah, but the world is crazy. I think there's a lot of people who who actually want to go to space. Um, like there'll be like thousands of people. <laughs> oh, I mean, if if Elon Musk made a sign up sheet and it's like a thousand dollars to get your name on the list, it would. Yeah, dude, it would be crazy. I would be interested to just to see how many people would be willing to sign up for that. I bet you if he he did it worldwide and was like, hey, you guys can sign up for like we we're gonna go to Mars, you know, not, everything's not solved yet, but you know, you guys are gonna be the first being thing. I bet you at least a million people in this whole world would sign up. And those the controller's gonna be a PlayStation controller connected <laughs> with Bluetooth. Yeah, I was like, ah, I'd never go to space. Not that, <laughs> not, well, I'd never go to um to Mars. I'd never want to go to Mars or colonize Mars. Because like I said, yeah, I've unless, seen Total Recall too many times to to think anything good would come out of that. Yeah, it looks too depressing. I was like, I like Earth, I like our sun, I like our air, I like our <laughs> There's a lot of play, dude. We could you could travel to a new city every day for the rest of your life and still not see all the cool stuff on this yeah. planet. So I, I keep my head down a little bit when it comes to that. Like there's smart people and I'm fascinated by the stars. Uh, but I feel like I, there's enough to keep me obsessed right down here on Earth, and I hope that yeah. doesn't make me sound like a like a bumpkin. But it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, but then you'll have you know people on the opposite side of the spectrum, which is okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, space. man. Yeah, I mean, like just that's how um, you had like uh, the trailblazers who went out to the west, right? They they were the crazy people <laughs> willing enough. I'm sure you know people on the east coast was like. What? I'm not going out there. You know how crazy it is. You know how long it took to get civilized over here? You're gonna start all over again. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I'm we're winding down here, but I want to ask you before we start doing plugs again, what are some other interesting conspiracy theories you've heard in the barbershop outside of flat Earth? Are, are there any that you were like, "Come on, guys!" Like you don't actually believe that, right? Yeah, there was, there was the flat Earth. Um, somebody had mentioned something else, and I was like, "Oh." You guys are kidding me, right? Um, man, I can give you some greatest hits, like um, like like the tra uh, Travis Scott and the um the, the Astro World thing, the Houston. Like people died, and it was like a that's a that's a big one. Is I think there's like a Michael Che episode where he jokes about anytime like a, a rapper gets big, everyone in the community is like, "Yo, you know, I, I love the album, but he probably killed a family member to get there." You know, like there's always <laughs> like this weird undercurrent. Of uh, people assuming the worst and, and some of those. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that one. Um but yeah, I mean, you, you never know. I'm I'm starting to believe some of the, the things that they say about Hollywood. 
<laughs> like what? Anything? Like, anything like, more specific? Like how you know how how uh, evil it is. Like behind the scenes, they have things like you know that they do kidnapping people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm like, hmm. How so uh, on. On that same note, how does that affect how much you care about like the Hollywood strike going on? Does that affect it at all? Does, does it make you think like, eh, I don't know, guys, like I don't want to join either side right now, or is it like, uh, you know, oh, when I say Hollywood, on... I, don't, I mean the higher ups in Hollywood, like the, the okay, okay, control stuff, like the writers and the actors. I don't think not even the actors, not even like the big budget actors. Maybe, maybe some of the big. <laughs> let's drop some names, bro. Let's get, let's go after. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so and I'm just I'm just curious on this one. I want to get too deep into it, but have you ever heard of the concept of Tartaria before, or like mud floods in the yeah. the context of flat Earth? So yeah. once you start going deep into the flat Earth, there's this next level of it where, in addition to the and and to me, flat Earth is the ultimate conspiracy theory for someone that doesn't believe anything. Like I don't believe anything anyone's ever written down in a book ever. Like no scientists, like it's all <laughs> lies from start to end. That's usually where you have to approach the flat earth aspect. So it's like any proof just goes out the window. But then there's another level of Tartaria where like let's say the United States had all of these incredible like ancient architecture all over the place and the sellers came in and knocked it all down or they just kind of painted on top of it and was like I made this you know what I mean but it was it was already there so like the city of Chicago or like some of the the old buildings in New York like they were there before the settlers even showed up um and that the settlers just kind of like erased this highly advanced it gets it gets weird man it gets out there but uh, anyways, that that kind of goes a hand in hand with some of the flat Earth when you go into those circles. Oh, that's that's interesting. That some of them. Oh yeah, so yeah, I know. So there's this one. Now that you say that, <laughs> there's this one theory that that's kind of interesting, but I don't really believe it. Um, is the the there's one that says uh, black people were here before um, before uh, Columbus was here. Like we were already here. That they lied to us and that um, we weren't shipped from Africa, that we were already here. And, you know, uh, that one's hard for me. <laughs> that one's hard for me to believe. Um, Does that come from a specific, uh, like, group or book or story or anything? Um, it's just something that I've heard before and I've seen on mm -hmm. the internet, and some people believe it. Um, is this related to like 5% or Nation of Gods and Earth or no, anything? Or is it think, separate from that? You would think, but no, it's not. It's not even a 5% of thing. It's just like something that just I've I've seen in the past few years. Like I think maybe I first started seeing it like maybe four. Another so, big one is giants too. The giants were here originally. Oh yeah, and uh, and and there's some quotes from like Abraham Lincoln explicitly saying that giants lived in these. You know, so and I mean maybe it was metaphorical, right? But people still point to that like there's proof. You know, get guaranteed proof. Um, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if giants existed before because you always had different forms of humanoids, right? Mm -hmm. On Earth, um, even before the Homo sapiens. And we've got so, a nasty track record of like wiping <laughs> wiping our competition out too. Yeah, you know, um, what do you call them? The, uh, the Neanderthals, they, mm -hmm. they were around the same times that we were. So who's to say that there wasn't another set of um, humanoids um, who were large walking around? And Where to you be at honest, on Bigfoot? Huh? Where are you at on Bigfoot? Bigfoot? Um, I don't really believe in Bigfoot because I'm like, you know, we would have, I mean, we would have seen, like, there would have been, like, he would have been captured by now. <laughs> so what about ghosts? But couldn't you say the same logic? Like, we would, we'd we'd have a ghost in a museum at this point. Like, yo, here's the ghost that we, we caught, you know, at the old manor. Well, I believe in ghosts because of one experience I've had. I was like, I remember my wife and I, we were um, uh, house hunting, or not house hunting, but we were looking for a house and- Ghost hunting? No. Just... <laughs> no. <laughs> we were looking for a house and um, this is one particular house. Inside of it was like, it was it was, it was weird because it was like, they still kept like some of that 1970s furniture. And so we were going through and then it was like this, um, this one room <laughs> and this closet. I was like, damn, that looked like some kind of Anne Frank closet <laughs> it was like where you would keep somebody in but um the whole place was just like weird and it was just like i felt like somebody was like watching me and i was like ah 
<laughs> it, set, it set the tone as soon as you walked in. It's like a stepping back in time, right? Yeah, and it was just, it wasn't just a time thing. It was just like something about that place was just like so creepy. And then um, I leaned to my wife and was like, "Man, I feel like somebody's watching us." I was like, "Like somebody's in here." She's like, "Yeah, me too." <laughs> I was like, yeah. "So it wasn't just me." So then, um, you know, the real estate agent, you know, finishes the tour and she's like, "Yeah, do you have any questions?" And I asked her. I was like, "Hey, who died um, in that room back there?" Yeah, I said, "Did somebody die in this house?" <laughs> she's like. Yeah, and you're not the first person to ask. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> so I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, there was a ghost in here. <laughs> I was like, you didn't, you didn't, I didn't see the ghost. Okay, I okay. Felt the ghost. <laughs> so, there, like, oh. so there's a, a concept called psychometry, which mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's a, it's like a pseudoscience. If you look at it on Wikipedia, it's gonna be like this is a pseudoscience, but psychometry is basically like when a dog or a cat enters like an abandoned room, but it like, like gets freaked out and they're like, Oh, the cat senses something or like, you know, yeah. it's, it's that, it's like that extra weird feeling that you can't mm -hmm. prove, but it claims that if something bad happens in an area, like the frequency or the vibrations of that horrible event kind of get embedded almost like a record recording, you know, like, like making a little script of it. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know if I would consider it ghost, but it's definitely ghost but, adjacent. But it felt like somebody was watching though. That's the thing. So I mean, really, so there was like, you felt like there was an entity in the room almost. Yeah. It was like you're in the room and it's like, you feel like, just like you it's hard to describe like were you on the fence before that and that pushed you over or did you already no, kind of believe in the concept I, I, I kind of believed in the concept of ghosts but you know i hadn't seen the ghosts and things so i was like you know I was like you know i wasn't on the fence i believed in ghosts but it wasn't like since i haven't seen it i wasn't like heavily like yes they're obviously ghosts but after that i was like yes <laughs> yeah, safe to say you didn't end up going with that place though right what's that you didn't end up go oh, going oh, with that place no, absolutely not. I was like, no. Nah. Are there like ghost? There's no ghost discounts. If there were, then I think people might be more accepting of it. No, nah, even if they gave me the house for free, I would have been like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for real. I was like, no. <laughs> well, hey, man, I, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, We're coming up on an hour. Could you please tell people where to find all your books uh, again? And, you know, anything that you've got online, any other projects that you want to pump? Yeah, so um, you could find me on socials at Dream Fury Comics. That's a D R E A M F U R Y C O M I C S. I think it's right there, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll put links on, on the description yeah. and everything so, where you can and, find all um, your comics. And you can find uh, my online shop at dreamfurycomics.com. Um, as far as projects, I'm writing um, a few things, but you know, it's, it's, it's so many stories in my head, and I'm just I can't like write just one at a time. So I'm like here, there, here, there, here. There. It's like, I feel you, man. I feel you. <laughs> writing. So right now I'm writing in pieces, so nothing you know really solid is coming. Um, and there's some stories that I've been trying to figure out. It's been really difficult for me to figure out. <clears throat> um, like I have the the plot and you know the characters and stuff, but how to structure the story and make it really interesting and you know, um, a real story, just some, that's the hard part. <laughs> like the idea of a story, like, like, Oh, I'm going to do this. And the guy who does this and, you know, he's going to do That's the easy part, but actually like structuring the story <laughs> is like, is the hard part. <laughs> yeah. When you actually sit down, you're like, okay, let me write this out and see yeah, what it looks yeah. like. And then all yeah. the plot holes start coming. And then the, at least for me, the worst part is like, Oh man, you know, like, um, uh, you know, Neil Gaiman did this, but his was so much better. And now all of a sudden you're like writing against the champs, right? It was like, <laughs> if you're just learning how to box, you're like, oh man, well, how would Muhammad Ali do this? And sometimes it's not the, the healthiest way to start out on something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, hey, I appreciate it, man. I want to I wanna talk more about the ghost stuff maybe in the future. So I'll oh, convince okay. you to come back and we can talk next time you got like a project coming. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. It, it was good catching up, man. And uh, just hang out for a couple seconds. I'm going to throw... Uh, a quick commercial and thank you again for watching the paranoid american podcast they said it was forbidden they said it was dangerous they were right introducing the paranoid american homunculus owner's manual dive into the arcane into the hidden corners of the occult this isn't just a comic it's a hidden tome of supernatural power all original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of juan ayala one of the only living homunculologists of our time 
Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus, ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day, knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart? Available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today.